Greetings and welcome to uh, this session that will be looking at uh, practical questions. Okay, now uh, these questions are more or less focused on the two previous uh, topics we've done that is uh, disorders of water and uh, electrolyte metabolism uh, and also acid base uh, imbalances. Okay, uh, I want to believe this session is uh, quite important okay in that uh, the you reading the notes and also listen to the explanatory videos may seem a bit abstract and uh, when you meet actual exam questions you may not be able to interpret the data that you are given about the patient with the exact accuracy that you may need to interpret it with okay so during this session I'm just going basically to bring out or highlight uh, a few sort of strategies or mechanisms on how you should think through and how to interpret data and how to actually extract vital information from a STEM question. Okay, so there are basically four questions uh, that I thought were pretty much uh, standard and uh, they cover the wide base that you may need to, to know as you that the acid base imbalances and water and electrolyte metabolism disorders okay so they are total about, about four okay i'm going to work through two and the remaining two you they will be uploaded onto your learning management uh, system and you may attempt them on your own and we'll obviously discuss them with time on the platform okay so let us begin we will first of all start with uh, question one, which is basically a question that looks at uh, interpretation of uh, acid-based data. This is basically arterial blood gas analysis. Okay. Now, uh, when interpreting acid-based data, uh, the first thing that you should do is be able to determine the primary uh, acid-base imbalance. Okay. Uh, by examining the pH, you determine is it an acidotic uh, imbalance or is it an alkalotic imbalance. The next step is for you to determine uh, the primary cause of that acid base imbalance. Is it uh, of respiratory origin or is it of metabolic origin? Okay, now how you do that basically you look at changes in carbon dioxide concentration or partial pressure, those who inform you about changes in the respiratory. Uh, parameters okay so we know that uh, generally speaking if uh, your partial pressure of carbon dioxide is going up meaning you're having respiratory acidosis if the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is going down it simply means you're having respiratory uh, alkalosis on the other hand to determine whether uh, or to determine the metabolic uh, derangements you look at two serum bicarbonate levels okay abbreviated as SBC okay serum bicarbonate concentration now if your serum bicarbonate concentration is increasing it simply means uh, that is a form of metabolic alkalosis if your serum bicarbonate levels are decreasing it simply means uh, what is probably going on is what metabolic acidosis okay with that brief background let us actually look at this data that we have here and see how best to interpret it okay so we'll start with uh, obviously the first one here which I'll highlight so that uh, we know that we're focusing on this one okay now as I said the first thing is to determine the acid base derangement okay so when we look at uh, this page of 7.6 and if we compare it to the uh, reference range of pH which is 7.35 to 7.45 it simply tells us that this pH has increased okay and that's and we know that an increase in pH simply represents what alkalosis okay so we know that the primary derangement in the patient is alkalosis okay so the next thing for us to determine is is this alkalosis respiratory or metabolic okay so the way to do that is basically you analyze separately or independently the changes in the partial pressure of carbon dioxide 
and also the changes in the partial pressure of uh, bicarbonate. Remember, uh, one of them may represent the primary cause of the derangement, the other may represent a compository mechanism. Okay, so it's always important to analyze both of them before you make a judgment call of which one is the primary cause and which one is the compository cause. Okay, now let's move on to our carbon dioxide concentration. Okay, so here our carbon dioxide concentration is at 3.1. Okay, and if we compare this to the reference range of uh, 4.5 to 6.1 kilopascals, we know that 3.1 is basically low, it's lower than the reference range. So meaning the concentration of carbon dioxide in this body is decreasing okay and we already know that a decrease in carbon dioxide concentration uh, simply refers to what respiratory alkalosis so this patient that has a carbon dioxide partial pressure of 3.1 is experiencing respiratory alkalosis okay at this time you may get tempted to say oh okay this patient has alkalosis so Carbon dioxide concentration is low, respiratory alkalosis, and that's the primary cause. Not necessary cause, at times you may have a mixed picture. Okay, so it's always important to analyze both the bicarbon concentration and the partial pressure of carbon dioxide before you actually make the judgment call. Okay, so since we know that due to the changes in carbon dioxide, respiratory alkalosis is occurring, next is for us to look at or to analyze the changes in bicarbonate concentration. Okay. Now, our patient here has a bicarbonate concentration of uh, 22 millimoles per liter. Okay. Now, remember, all, all these uh, parameters that we are looking at are arterial blood gases. Okay. In some questions, you may get both venous blood uh, concentrations and arterial blood gas concentrations. So, in interpreting acid-base balance, always use the arterial blood gas data. Okay. So, Serum bicarbonate of 22 millimoles per liter is within normal range. Okay, this reference range here is 22 to 26 millimoles per liter. So 22 is within normal range. Okay, so in short, there is actually uh, no pathological or compository change in bicarbonate, so no change. Okay, so now we have everything we need to interpret our acid base imbalance. Okay, so this patient basically has respiratory alkalosis with no metabolic compensation. Okay, so this patient here has what? So the food diagnosis for this patient is uh, respiratory alkalosis with no metabolic compensation. Okay, so whenever you are asked to interpret uh, acid-based data, this is basically the process that you go through and your final diagnosis should always be presented like that. You should state what the primary uh, cause of the acid-based balance is, okay, is it metabolic or is it respiratory? And after that, you should also state whether there is compensation or not, okay? So like our patient here, final diagnosis, respiratory alkalosis with no metabolic compensation. Okay, now most of the time when you receive a condition that has no compensatory mechanism, it may be that the condition is too acute. So, uh, okay, yeah, so this is our patient here. So we can uh, now move on to the second parameter. Okay, so as we said, now I will, I'll be a little bit faster since we already know the process. Okay, so let's say pH of uh, 7.19. Okay, so when we compare it to a reference pH, this pH is low, so it simply means acidosis. Okay, the next we look at our carbon dioxide partial pressure. Carbon dioxide partial pressure is 4, our reference range is 4.5 to 6.1. So, meaning here carbon dioxide partial pressure is reducing. Okay, a reduction in partial pressure of carbon dioxide is synonymous with what respiratory alkalosis. Okay. So here there is the respiratory alkalosis. 
Okay. Next, we go to serum bicarbonate concentration. Okay. Here, our serum bicarbonate concentration is at 11, which is obviously below the uh, normal range, lower normal range of 22. Okay. So now we know that a reduction in bicarbonate concentration simply refers to a metabolic form of acidosis. Okay. So here we have metabolic acid, acidosis. Okay. So now, what is our final diagnosis for the patient? Okay. We know the primary problem is acidosis. Okay. Then we can realize that uh, there's obviously a reduction in the partial pressure of uh, carbon dioxide. And lastly, there is a reduction in the partial uh, in the concentration of bicarbonate. So this is obviously metabolic acidosis with respiratory compensation. Okay. Now, what is the most likely thing causing the respiratory compensation here? Okay. As the body senses the changes in pH due to gain of acid probably here. Okay. This is because why am I saying gain of acid? This is because the drop in the serum bicarbonate concentration is most likely due to the buffering action to try and buffer the gain in acid. Okay. So when the body realizes that one of the uh, compensatory mechanisms it, uh, uh, it actually activates is hyperventilation so that you get rid of as much carbon dioxide as possible to reduce the pH change. Okay. So here probably uh, this patient is hyperventilating and this is what will lead to a reduction in the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. So our final diagnosis for this patient is metabolic acidosis with respiratory compensation. Okay. Next, we can go to uh, the next one, okay, this will be my last one in this table, the other three you can work them out uh, on your own, okay, so we had the pH of uh, 7.47, okay, which is basically above our reference range, so meaning this patient has what, alkalosis, okay, our partial pressure of uh, carbon dioxide here is at uh, 3.5, Okay, meaning it's actually reducing. Okay, and the reduction in the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is associated with what? Alkalosis. Okay, this is respiratory alkalosis. The next, we we'll look at bicarbonate concentration. Here it's at 18, which is definitely low because our reference range, the lowest is 22. So, meaning there's acidosis here. Okay, there is metabolic acidosis. Okay, so from this data that we have here, we can already tell that our patient has respiratory alkalosis with metabolic compensation. Okay, so this is basically how you interpret acid-base data. Of, of course, uh, this table is a bit uh, limiting in that you don't have, uh, it's not asking about other questions. So some of the other questions that you can be asked in such data is things like uh, calculation of the an ion gap, okay, which can either be high or low. Okay, so most of the time when you calculate an ion gap, we are trying basically to determine what type of metabolic acidosis the patient has. Okay. We already know that high and iron gap metabolic acidosis uh, is usually due to gain of acid. Okay. You know, as I'm sure as we go along, we'll be able to look at some of these uh, parameters. Okay. For the remaining uh, three, I think these are things that you can work out as practice for yourselves just to try and uh, know how to interpret the acid base data. Okay. So, I'll move on to the second uh, question. Okay, 
Now, second question is more of uh, basically a clinical scenario question. Okay, and this one looks at uh, basically treats you are the new intern on court UTH. Okay, and a 12 year old boy is brought into casualty with a three day history of severe diarrhea, which was brought due, which was thought to be due to food poisoning. Uh, when you examine him, probably he appears drowsy and he, he uh, and is clinically dehydrated with a blood pressure of uh, 95 over 60 and a pulse of 100 beats per minute. Okay, so you order for some blood tests. Okay, and those are the results that are presented there. Okay, now from this you can see that we definitely don't have uh, any acid uh, arterial blood gas uh, results. Okay, but uh, most of the time in such a question you may also get values for uh, arterial blood gas analysis. Okay, most of the time our questions tend to be very comprehensive, so you also get values for arterial blood gas analysis. That may require you to interpret the acid base status of the patient. Okay. So now, when you look at the data that we have here, okay, even before we go to the questions, it's very important for you to pick out very uh, important uh, things happening to the patient. So, first of all, we need to know what is important for you to know is the age of the patient. Okay. So, this is a child. Okay. Next history of severe diarrhea for three days okay so that is already an acute form of diarrhea okay now obviously it's due to food uh, poisoning okay we may not know what exactly caused that but uh, we know it's a child having severe diarrhea okay for three days and they are having features of cardiovascular collapse okay reducing blood pressure and an increasing pulse okay we are not told whether the pulse is straight or full volume, but uh, it will not matter. But basically, the cardiovascular system is actually going down. Okay. Next is go to, we go to the actual uh, results that we have. So look at these results. So basically, we have a sodium concentration of 156 millimoles per liter, which is higher than the reference range. Okay. So meaning hypernatremia is occurring here. Okay. Then we have a potassium. Uh, serum concentration of 2.7 which is less than the reference range okay so there's hypernatremia and there's hypokalemia okay then we have total uh, carbonic concentration okay of 15 so basically it's going down so this is a patient if your total bicarbonate concentration is actually going down it simply means even the arterial bicarbonate concentration may actually be reducing okay and from our previous question, we know that reduction in bicarbonate levels is associated with what? Acidosis. So this is a patient who may be experiencing uh, a metabolic form of acidosis, which is not unusual because in somebody having cardiovascular collapse, okay, uh, blood supply to the organs becomes inefficient. And this is a patient who is likely to go into what? Lactic acidosis, okay, due to anaerobic respiration, okay. The chloride levels are slightly above normal uh, urea levels are way way above the normal okay that 15 millimoles per liter okay this is way way above normal such as in the territory of what a patient that needs renal replacement therapy in the form of dialysis okay then we have uh, creatinine that is at 115 okay which is basically uh, within what you expect to be normal okay now what is very interesting here is that the creatinine and urea are actually used to measure uh, the state of function of your kidneys. Okay, these are like the prototype uh, renal function tests. So they're actually assessing how your kidneys are working. Okay, so what you expect normally to find is that if the kidneys are failing, both your urea and creatinine, you expect them to increase. But here only urea is increased, whilst creatinine is within normal. Okay, this is a very important uh, finding. Okay, this simply means that uh, yes, your kidneys are failing, but the problem leading to kidney failure is actually reduced blood supply to the kidney. Reduced renal perfusion is most likely the cause here. Okay, and that is a cause of what we know call what 
preno renal failure okay uh, that's the concept that uh, you look at as you go on as you study uh failure especially systemic pathology when you look at uh, renal failure okay so just remember elevated urea no more creatinine okay that's most like that's pointing you towards what pre renal uh, acute kidney injury okay and you expect it in this case this is a patient with uh, severe dehydration okay and obviously blood supply to the kidneys is compromised uh, the last parameter there is your glucose levels okay which is 4.2 uh, which is basically within normal range okay so now that we know we have an idea of what is going on with the patient uh, let us look at what the questions are actually asking so the first question is explain the sodium result okay so this question is basically trying to say or trying to ask you to identify what could be leading to this kind of sodium result okay somebody is dehydrated and if their sodium is uh, very high okay if you remember from uh, water and electrolyte imbalance uh, or even from your physiology uh, water and sodium are usually managed together okay but in this case you can obviously see that uh, due to the cardiovascular parameters this patient is losing more water than they are losing sodium okay so this is a classical case of what hypernatremic dehydration okay so this patient is having hypernatremic dehydration okay now we know that in hypernatremic dehydration okay one of the uh, resulting uh, problems is that before cardiovascular collapse occurs uh, uh, what's this intracellular dehydration usually occurs okay and in this case obviously there was uh, a cerebral dehydration going on meaning this could have actually interfered with the patient response to the first impulse okay so meaning the patient would not have responded adequately to the first impulse and thus they would have been losing fluid continuously but would not have been drinking adequate water to ensure fluid replacement okay so what explains this sodium result hypernatremic dehydration okay that is also accompanied by cerebral dehydration okay interfering with the uh, first impulse or the response to the first impulse due to uh, the alterations in the mental status of the patient okay second question is explain the urea creatinine results okay you see this question i actually gave the explanation earlier on okay so this basically this basically is pointing towards a prerenal kind of renal failure okay and the major cause of prerenal kind of renal failure is reduced renal perfusion okay now in somebody who is severely dehydrated this is a patient actually who is going into shock okay one of the compensatory mechanisms that occurs in a severe dehydration or in shock is that there is widespread vasoconstriction to other organs okay so meaning the blood supply to other organs uh, is reduced whereas there is vasodilatation in the blood vessels going to the heart and to the brain okay so as soon as vasoconstriction occurs in the renal artery the amount of blood going to the kidneys reduces okay meaning the urea which is normally excreted by the kidneys is no longer excreted okay and it begins to accumulate in the blood okay but for creatinine creatinine is usually secreted okay and if blood is not going to the kidneys creatinine won't be secreted so it's no more uh, level its levels may be within normal range okay so this kind of uh, urea creatinine results simply points to the fact of acute kidney injury of the prerenal kind okay prerenal acute kidney injury next question is what would you expect the urine what do you expect his urinary sodium to be okay now this question is simply testing your understanding of how uh, the body responds to changes in water and electrolytes okay 
Now we know that uh, most of the body electrolytes, such as sodium, okay, uh, in terms of loss, you either you either lose them through uh, the GIT or through the kidneys. Okay. Now this is a patient who has uh, diarrhea. Okay. So meaning the fluid loss is occurring through the GIT. Okay. So now in a patient having uh, GIT fluid losses, what do you expect the renal response to be? That's what that is what this question is basically asking you. Okay. So if you are losing fluid and electrolytes through the GIT, the the normal renal response is to reduce the loss of fluid and electrolytes through the kidneys. Okay. So in this patient. We expect that the concentration of sodium in the urine to be very, very low. Okay. The cutoff uh, range or mark that we use here is 20 millimoles per liter. Okay. So, in a patient with GIT losses of fluid, you do not expect the urinary sodium levels to be greater than 20 millimoles per liter. Okay. So, in this patient, the urinary sodium levels should be less than 20 millimoles per liter. Okay. But if the problem was with the kidneys, such that the, this patient is losing a lot of fluid through the kidneys, the urinary sodium concentration is expected to be higher than 20 millimoles per liter. Okay. Uh, next is what is the cause of the low sodium? Okay. So if we look at our results here, sorry, the low potassium. Uh, potassium is at 2.7. Okay which is basically below that okay now if you recall uh, from the lecture on potassium we know that uh, the uh, body stores of potassium are very minimal and over 90 percent of the potassium that you have in your body is via the diet okay and this is the patient with diarrhea so definitely the major cause of this potassium deficiency here is increased the gastrointestinal losses of potassium through the diarrhea okay so the body is not absorbing enough potassium because most of it is being lost with the diarrhea that is the primary cause but again there's there should be uh, from this data you can actually see that uh, there could be another cause okay this is a patient who is going into shock or severe dehydration okay so and uh, the primary cause of this fluid loss is the GIT. One of the responses of the body is to activate the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, okay, to try and conserve water. Now, one of the functions of aldosterone is to increase sodium reabsorption in the nephrons of the kidney, okay. As sodium reabsorption is being increased, okay, it is exchanged, uh, it is actually gained at the loss of potassium. Okay, so at the kidney levels, due to the activity of the aldosterone from the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, you be gaining sodium at the expense of potassium loss. Okay, so apart from increased potassium losses through the GIT, another cause that could or another mechanism that could explain this low potassium is secondary hyperaldosteronism. Okay, as a response to the decreasing blood pressure and fluid levels in the cardiovascular system. Okay. Then the fifth question is give one other clinical condition in which you would find a similar total uh, carbonate uh, result together with a low potassium. Okay. Now, this, this is a bit of a tricky question in that if you look at your lecture on acid base. Uh, imbalance okay changes in carbon dioxide and bicarbonate are associated with the changes in potassium here according to the results that we have here uh, you're actually losing uh, bicarbonate okay so you expect uh, uh, basically this to be sort of an acidotic picture okay the total bicarbonate is reducing and a reduction in uh, bicarbonate levels is just associated with what metabolic acidosis okay and metabolic acidosis 
is usually associated with the hyperkalemia. Okay, increase in uh, hydrogen ions is associated with hyperkalemia. Okay, but in this uh, patient, okay, the changes in bicarbonate are associated with the low potassium. Okay, which is a bit unusual as I said earlier on. Okay, so very few conditions can present like this. And uh, one of the major conditions that can actually lead to this kind of picture is renal tubular acidosis. Okay, so if we were to give one other condition that could actually give this picture of uh, bicarbonate derangement symbolizing acidosis associated with hypokalemia instead of hyperkalemia, I would bet you this would be renal tubular acidosis. Okay, the sixth question is calculate. Uh, osmolarity okay so this basically takes you to all you need to know here is the formula of osmolarity so once you plug in the formula and plug in the values you should be able to know what it is so osmolarity is equal to what uh, so the normal osmolarity here should be equal to uh, two the, that is the normal Formula for osmolarity, okay, is that one? So sodium plus potassium concentration multiplied by two plus the glucose concentration plus the urea concentration, okay. So now, since we know what these are, so what we can simply go there is look at what what are the values there, okay. So our sodium is at 156. Let me just port my calculator. So our sodium is at uh, 156. Okay. Plus our potassium is at 2.7. 2.7. This gives us a total of 158.7. Uh, but remember, you have to multiply this by 2 according to our formula for calculating osmolarity. Okay. This gives us a uh, uh, 317.4 okay then this you have to add the concentration of glucose which is 4.2 and also the concentration of uh, urea which is 15 so our serum uh, osmolarity here in this patient is 336.6 milliosmos per liter okay which basically if we look at our reference range for cellar moss morality which is uh, 285 to 292 this is basically increased okay and this is what we expected okay remember from question one when explaining the sodium result we said this is a classic case of what hypernatremic dehydration okay and in hypernatremic dehydration cellar moss morality increases okay and this is basically what we have found here. So this actually agrees with the clinical scenario. Okay. So the cell osmolarity has increased to 336.6 millimoles per liter. Milliosmos per liter. Okay. So this is equal to 336.6 milliosmos per liter. Okay. Now, please. Always remember to use uh, the correct SI units here. Okay, there's a tendency for students always to miss out the units and just put figures. Okay, you have to give a complete answer. So even the units that you use are very vital here. Okay, now if it was something like osmolality, instead of milliosmos per liter, we would have uh, gone to talk about milliosmos per kg. Okay. Then the next question here is asking us uh, about what changes occur in the brain in response to this abnormality. Okay, so this again still goes back to question one. Okay, hypernatremic dehydration. What are the what are the changes that you expect in hypernatremic dehydration? Okay, so we already know that hypernatremic dehydration is usually associated with what? Uh, intracellular dehydration okay so one of the changes that you expect to occur in the brain here is that the brain cells will become dehydrated so this patient will also present with what features of cerebral dehydration 
Okay, and what are some of the features of cerebral dehydration? These are basically uh, features that suggest an altered level of consciousness, okay, or, or altered mental uh, levels, okay. They can range from things such as irritability, lethargy, confusion, coma, okay. At times, if the sodium levels are too high, death could result, okay. So, in this patient, what changes do we expect to occur in the brain? Cerebral dehydration. And the last question is asking us to look at or to outline the principles of treatment of this patient or this boy. Okay, now if we go back to the stem question here, okay, this is a classic case of severe diarrhea. Okay, now the main step for diarrhea treatment anywhere, okay, is fluid replacement. Okay, um, food poisoning could be due to anything, salmonella, shigella, even cholera. Okay, now when you look at the treatment for all these, of course, you may employ some antibiotics to kill the microorganism. Okay, but the main step for any diarrhea disease, especially of the acute type, is fluid replacement. If you do not adequately replace the fluids, it doesn't matter how many antibiotics you give the patient will die from severe dehydration and shock, okay, like we are seeing in this uh, patient, okay. So here the most important thing is rehydrating the patient, fluid replacement, and because cardiovascular collapse is already evolving, oral fluids will not be of help here, okay. The most important thing is actually IV fluids. You can actually go even for double IV access with IV fluids, okay. No more saline here will be your best bet because you want to ensure you replace the what? Intravascular volume. Okay. So fluid replacement. Moni so in terms of treatment uh, outline here, what we we'll do for this patient, okay, is fluid replacement, okay, via intravenous infusion, okay. What fluid do we pick? Most most commonly or most likely normal saline is what we we'll use here. Secondly, you go for electrolyte imbalance treatment. Okay, this is the patient who has hypernatremia, okay, due to dehydration. So as soon as you replace the fluids, the hypernatremia will begin to recorrect itself. Okay, but there's another electrolyte imbalance here of hypokalemia. Okay, now of course that is a moderate form of hypokalemia. But if the situation is not corrected, it could actually result into severe hyperkalemia. You know that one of the uh, one of the major problems with potassium imbalances is the effect of potassium on the heart. Okay, so correction of the hypokalemia may be important here. Okay, the next you also want to obviously take care of the underlying cause. Okay, we are told this food poisoning that causes diarrhea. So you may want to actually know what organism was involved in the food poisoning, okay? Uh, this can be done by stool analysis, microscopy, culture, and sensitivity, okay? Once you know the organism, you can institute the necessary antibiotics to get rid of the organism. Then the fourth thing that you may want to do in the treatment uh, principles here is to actually monitor the patient vitals, okay? One of the most important things here to monitor is urine output. Okay, especially as you give the fluids, because the urine output will uh, sort of be a proxy to recovery of renal function. Renal function, okay. As the urine, uh, as the renal, as the kidneys or as perfusion to the kidneys increases, renal output or urine output should actually increase. Okay, so monitor vitals and such as urine output. Those, of course, you want to keep an eye on the changes in blood pressure. Okay. You want to keep them within normal range, okay? Those are the basic uh, treatment uh, protocols, okay? Uh, fluid replacement, okay? Uh, correction of the electrolyte imbalances, uh, detection of the primary offending organism and treating it, okay? Monitoring your vitals and keeping them within normal range, okay? So these are the basic uh, treatment protocols. Okay, now 
the remaining questions these are as i said earlier on i'll post them in your group or on the learning management system for you to attempt on your own but if you look at them they're not very complex questions these are questions that i know you manage okay so in case of any questions or any guidance on the questions just post them on the learning management platform and i'll be able to give the guidance but otherwise i think these are questions that you can manage so i'll look at some of your responses then uh we'll probably discuss them or i'll upload what the ideal answers would be for these questions so that you compare them with what you have okay remember these are practice questions and most of the time these are the kind of questions you are likely to encounter in your exams okay i hope i sincerely hope this will be helpful okay otherwise thank you very much and good luck